later on in the evening so that if you want to make a comment and you don't want that comment recorded on television or you don't want your face recorded on RCTV, that you'll um, be able to still participate. Um, just a, 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 a quick plug for our co-sponsors of tonight's event. If you have a smartphone on you, um, I want to invite you to take <laughs> it out and like the Reading Embraces Diversity Facebook page and the Human Relations Advisory Committee Facebook page. So those are our two co-sponsors for tonight's event, and um, both groups, um, Reading Embraces Diversity and the Human Relations Advisory Committee, um, of which Heather here is the chair, um, have been incredibly um, supportive of tonight's event, along with the school system, um, Superintendent Doherty, and um, Sarah, the uh, principal here um, at Coolidge School, uh, we're so grateful for all of your support in putting together tonight's event. Before we introduce you to our inspiring guest of honor, we would like to do a little experiment. Um, you were handed an index card, or you should have been on your way in, and I want you to um, take it out and look at it carefully. <laughs> Examine it. If you didn't get an index card, I will get one. <laughs> Linda, Linda will get you an index card if you don't have one yet. Or you can look on with your neighbor. This is a sharing experiment. So look at your index card. Now fold it in half. Any direction is fine. No wrong answers. Now fold it again. Now fold it again. Now fold it again. You don't have to be careful. Just fold it. There you go. So you've now folded your index card four times and it's shiny, right? You have changed it. You have, you have made a mark on that index card. Now try to unfold it. Try to undo what you did to that index card. You can unfold it, right? You can unfold it, you can open it back up again, but you've made a mark on it. You can try to smooth it out, you can try to push hard, but you can't make it exactly the same as it was before. Each wrinkle in that card represents the impacts that you made on it. It will never be the same again. Now it's the same with people who have experienced disrespect or discrimination or bullying. And the same with communities who have experienced hate, the abuse of power, and the appearance of symbols that represent those things, hate and power. But like Dr. Ornstein, we have the power to do something positive while moving forward. The Anti-Defamation League points out that words are important. When negative words and symbols are accepted in a community, they can form a foundation of hate. Words can be used as weapons or they can be used as tools of peace. They can escalate into violence, or they can be used to build a community. Our request is that tonight, in our conversation with Dr. Ornstein, that our words would be used to share our feelings and ideas in respectful ways. That our words are used to bring community together in dealing with difficult subjects. So to start this process, please turn to your neighbor and for one minute each, so in pairs, no more than two, share one very quick story of a way in which symbols or words or deeds have changed your life. It could be a positive story, a way in which somebody's words helped you, or a negative story, a way in which somebody's words or deeds harmed you. So think for just 10 seconds of what that story might be for all my introverts in the room. Have you, have you identified that story? Me too, I'm an introvert. Okay, have you identified that story? 
Okay, now turn to your partner and share for one minute. opportunities after this evening and throughout this evening. So um, tonight, I know that your index card is a little worse for the wear from holding it in pieces, but I don't want you to throw it away because you're going to have the opportunity to um, write down any um, notes or questions that you might have while Dr. Ornstein is speaking this evening. You'll, um, I, I want, uh, you can write down and um, jot down any questions as a reminder of what you might like to ask her. And um, if you want, you can hand your index card with your question on it to one of our volunteers who will be walking around with baskets at the end um, of her presentation to read your question aloud if you don't want to read it um, on camera. Oh, um, I was going to tell you a little bit about Reading Embraces Diversity. 
So um, our mission is to, to promote diversity throughout the community of Reading through um, activities such as this one. And so we hope that you'll continue to join us. Our next open meeting is on Wednesday, December 6th at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, at my church, Old South United Methodist. And so um, anyone is welcome to join us, and I hope that you'll, you'll come and check us out. Um, we have um, a bunch of... Uh, opportunities for you to get involved in the community and some are events like this planning and putting on events for the community like this um, and some are um, all, we have all kinds of ideas um, in the hopper and if you have some ideas for um, what kinds of things um, can make our community um, a more diverse and accepting place then we want to hear them and we want to get on board with those too and then when we move into our time of discussion i want to invite you um, to have the same kind of care and attentiveness that you just had with each other while you're telling, uh, while you're telling one another's stories. And so, just as some rules, some guidelines for communication, I want to encourage you um, to, uh, if you feel comfortable, to use your name before you speak, so that we um, know who you are. Um, to speak from your own experience, so rather than, um, so rather than uh, putting an experience on somebody else, to speak from your. Speak from, from where you're coming from. Use, use I statements. Um, to refrain from um, putting down somebody else's experience. To trust someone else's truth. To trust that what they say is true for them. To so trust what, what other people have said into the space. And to be careful of your own body language and your own tone as we enter this, this space. And to just generally have respect for one another. All right, I'm excited to share this evening with you. And I'm going to turn it over to Heather and Linda. Hi everyone, I'm Heather McLean, I'm the Chair of the Human Relations Advisory Committee in Reading. Um, our mission is to um, educate and promote diversity throughout our community here in town. Um, tonight we're here for a very special conversation with an incredible doctor, psychiatrist, professor, writer, grandmother, mother, and friend, Dr. Anna Ornstein. Dr. Ornstein's presence here is made even more poignant by her escape from the final solution, the Holocaust. She is here and choosing to tell us about her experiences. Why folks ask would she want to return to her own mind and her heart to transport us to such a brutal time in history? The answer we have heard her tell over and over again is because we must not forget, because we must learn from history, and because we must not only learn from history, but also apply its lessons to our present to protect our future, the future of our families, our country, our democracy, and our world. Even though we did not walk alongside Anna and her mother as they approached the selection, narrowly escaping the gas chambers at Auschwitz, even though we did not carry heavy rocks or use disgusting latrines in a work camp where the food was so <coughs> scarce that bread was coveted under your pillow so that your stomach would have something to digest in the morning, even though we did not lose our brothers to the knock on the door or our father and grandmother to the finger pointing to the left, we can bear witness to the Holocaust through Dr. Bornstein's eyes. Dr. Ornstein experienced all of that and so much more after being torn from her Hungarian home at age 17. All she had were the clothes on her back and a small suitcase that ultimately was snatched along with her hair and clothes and most of her family. The one thing that could never take, the one thing they could never take from Dr. Ornstein was her humanity. The Nazis tried very hard, but they didn't succeed. She captures many of these experiences in her book, My Mother's Eyes, Holocaust Memories of a Young Girl. And now I need to turn it over to Linda. <laughs> My name is Linda Snow Doxter, and I'm a member of the Reading and Braces Diversity. I met Dr. Ornstein, <laughs> my dear friend Anna, on May 9, 2013, when she came to Reading as one of the speakers at the um, musical, <coughs> musical healing after the Holocaust program here. She and Edgar Krasa and Mark Ludwig, who's the director of the Terrorism Music Foundation, you saw the collection um, been outside, came and spoke to us about how the hardships didn't end after the concentration camps were, liber were liberated. There was a lot more that happened. Um, Dr. Ornstein has been accompanying me to Reading's middle schools and high school and for community programs since 1919. Uh, 2013, sorry, um, enabling students and citizens to bear witness, changing lives, especially mine, 
with your inspiration and your positive attitude. The insights that Dr. Hornstein is going to share with us today did not start when she was thrown into that crowded cattle car heading to Auschwitz. They started years before in her hometown with the racial laws that separated the Jewish citizens from their neighbors. Her father could no longer run his business. Anna, young Anna, could not attend the public schools. She couldn't swim in the swimming pool that her parents raised the money to build, even when her neighbors and her friends were swimming in that swimming pool. If that sounds familiar, you're right. The Nazis learned about segregation laws, racial laws, from America. Not something to be proud of, but humbling and important to know. After surviving the camps and walking for weeks through hostile towns to get home, there was no home to go to, little family to left, left to reunite, reunite with, and the still the same rampant anti-Semitism. But Anna and her mom were determined to survive, and that they did. They met helpful people along the way. Her mom became director of an orphanage, caring for the children orphaned, orphaned by Hitler and his henchmen. They found Paul Ornstein still alive, or rather, he found them. And once he and Anna were married, they escaped from Hungary to Germany, where they lived amongst their past assailment, assailants, SS officers, and silent bystanders in order to finish their medical degrees. From there, they emigrated to Cincinnati, where they raised their three children. Actually, they came to Boston first. And then they went to Cincinnati, where they raised their three children, who became psychiatrists. Who would have known? <laughs> and from there, they moved back to Boston, and we are so grateful they did. <laughs> they have spent their whole lives helping others, despite the hateful and violent way they were treated by their friends, neighbors, their country, and ultimately their world. Dr. Bornstein comes to us today to share her first-hand experience in pre- and post-Nazi Europe, <coughs> and engage us in comparing and contrasting that history with our own current-day experiences. She wants us to ask questions. I'm going to repeat that. She wants us to ask questions. I have heard her answer the toughest questions. She's pretty stalwart and hardy. She wants to engage our different viewpoints. That, she believes, is one of the blessings of democracy. She wants us to be, and I quote, a thinking audience, not a passive one, and to actively engage in conversation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend and my inspiration, Dr. Anna Ornstein. Can you hear me all right? Because I'm a little bit hoarse, so I don't hear my own voice, but I hope you can hear me okay. And you don't mind if I don't get up. I usually stand and I like to walk around and meet everybody close by, but it's better if I stay put. <laughs> then I know I can last for the rest of the evening. Now, one of the reasons that uh, Linda was, thank you, Linda, thank you. And thank you for inviting me and having me here. And I really do thank for the school <laughs> for having me back in this familiar room now. You know, I have been here many times before, had some wonderful time with the eighth graders. That's where we meet and usually meet. Linda, you do me one more favor, sweetheart. Would you bring that table here for me a little bit closer so I can put my... <coughs> I don't particularly like to read out of my paper, but I tend to wheel off and go into little side conversations and it can take me away from my main subject and that is why I want to read the story. But I cannot thank you enough for having me back again. I cannot open this. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Here's another one. 
I will be drinking quite a bit. One of the reasons is that I don't want to spend time telling my story because I tell my story frequently and you can read about it and you can feel free to ask me about it. My reason for being excited about the whole idea of Reading Embracing Diversity is because I'm so, so pleased with the response that this community is showing to the threat of having our diversity in any way interfered with or taken away or somehow looked upon as not a desired way of being. This whole notion of separating people by religion or ethnic groups or in any way is so painful to me to think in those terms. And I think it has to do with the fact that I had lived through what I had lived through without ever expecting to what had happened. I was born in 1927, so I really was a very little girl when Hitler came to power. And I cannot say that I knew too much of what was happening in Germany or in Europe in general, except that our small community where I grew up was only 15 kilometers away from the then Slovak border. And Slovakia got involved with deportations and ghettoization much earlier during the war than the Hungarian Jews did. So we knew that long trains were going somewhere, but we didn't know where they were going. And that our relatives from Czechoslovakia and from Vienna, I had an uncle living in Vienna, disappeared. But we did not know where to. It's difficult for you to imagine now that you have news on your fingertips, you reach in your pocket and you can tell what's happening in the world. But living in that small community, we really did not know. Now I wonder, I often think, my mom and dad, they must have known a lot more than they shared with us. They protected us from uh, what was going on. So it, to me, in a personal way, did come as a surprise that I couldn't go to the swimming pool, for example, because that's where I wanted to learn to swim. No, we accepted the river. We decided that it was much healthier. We thought it was really much better. The river was very rapid flowing, and it was difficult <laughs> to get back where you started from. So we would go to the next town and get out of the river and then walk back, and we thought we had it better than those who had to go to that dirty swimming pool. <laughs> so you know, you kind of get adjusted to those things, and that can be a problem. And this is what I want to talk about. How not to accept what should not be accepted. So from here on, if you permit me, I'm going to read to you. I drink with some frequency because my, dry, my um, throat gets very dry. I mentioned earlier, I think I mentioned to you, Andy, that things become important to us when we feel it on our own skin. I don't think we should blame it ourselves for that. We were not born to reach out to others. We have to learn how to do that. We first protect our own kin and our own kind. That's not prejudice. It is natural that we do that. And that's because that is so natural. And that we be, because we live in societies that we end up learning that we have to reach out to those who are not like us and who are different. Because that is how this country was built. This is how it all started. When you think about the fact that you learn history from books, it is always helpful to think, what was it like to be there at that time? And this is, I think, why Linda and those who invite me to your schools value my conversations, because 
I can tell you what it's like for a little girl to feel prejudiced against or what it's like to worry about Christmas or Easter because that's when our windows will be broken because we were supposedly, we were the ones who killed Jesus, except I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, to think that crimes of that nature would be handed down generation and nurtured in people's minds. It's something that you have to know, not from history books, because that they are actually happening. People are persecuted because that great, 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 great grandparents did something that they don't even know they did, or maybe they didn't. Nevertheless, this is what you are paying for. So I did not know what was happening at that time, but I learned a great deal about the Holocaust afterwards. And one of the things that struck me as being very interesting is that there is one particular night that people commemorate and remember, and that night was the night of November 9, 1938. That was a night that appeared as if the people who were burning the synagogues all over Germany did it spontaneously. But you have to think about it. How spontaneous could it be that the synagogues are burning in Frankfurt and Berlin and Würzburg at the same time? They were. Synagogues were burned that night, November 9, 1938 and certain, close to 100 people in Berlin alone were arrested. And then many, many more following that night were uh, suiciding and they were killed. And at that point already in 1938, there were three concentration camps to which many of the people were then 30,000. I understand was the number. My question has been, how come we are commemorating that night when so much happened before 1938? It was in 1933, five years before that, that the Jewish books were burning. You all know about the book burning. And it was not only Jewish books, it was the books whom they considered not quite in keeping with what the Third Reich was all about. So this is five years before that, that it was already in 1935 that the racial laws were passed. By then, Jewish doctors could not treat non-Jewish patients. Jewish lawyers could no longer practice their art. Jewish shops were all uh, boycotted with uh, things, don't buy it. Why was it that we are commemorating that night of the night of the broken glass when the synagogues were burned, when so much else was happening that already indicated what was happening? Because it was after that night that uh, the largest number of Jews tried to get out of the country. They did not go before. What do you think happened? Why didn't they not go before? They did some. But the real fear was because now what was political and which was what uh, was something still more tolerable turned into violence. Now it wasn't enough to persecute, now we had to kill. And once the more political and the more social degradation, degradation and persecution occurred, now it turned into violence, now it became life and death, and it was at that point. And I would suggest to you, the problem was that they had accepted and lived with what happened because that encouraged the people in power 
to bring more and more uh, serious and horrible uh, restrictions about and to start the killing machine. And this is why I feel that whatever we are experiencing that appears to be innocent and looking the other way is a very dangerous thing to do. What made the night particularly horrifying was the fact that the atrocities were not only carried out by Hitler's stormtroopers, but with the active participation of civilians. The police looked on and the firefighters only acted to prevent the fire from spreading. And then there were the clapping, singing onlookers who brought their children to take part in this funny spectacle. In our current political climate, I am placing my hope into the protest marches and the acts of civil disobedience more than in our elected officials who, fearful of losing their positions, appear to follow the leader regardless of how destructive his policies may be. A recent experience in a neighboring town and this is your town, really raised my spirits. When an anti-Semitic vandalism was not taken sufficiently seriously, a group became organized with the mission of promoting diversity. I was extremely excited about that idea. We have to remember that Jews were not deported from Denmark and Bulgaria because the police refused to follow orders to collect them for deportation. This story is not known well enough that there were two countries that Jews could remain because the people refused to collect them. At the time of that broken grass, when all the killings began, there was expression of disgust but there was no sign of resistance by the civilian population. Eventually, a clergy underground was formed, but by then, Nazi ideology was accepted by the majority of the population, and anyone helping Jews to hide or to escape also became target of persecution. Those who actively resisted were extraordinarily courageous men, and women. I knew one of them well. Herman Maas was a Protestant minister. He was our benefactor when I, my husband, along with about 30 Jewish students, all Holocaust survivors, attended the university in Heidelberg after the war. The question we have to ask ourselves is this. What happened that night? I already told you that, but I, let me repeat it. That me, it I, I don't want to repeat it. I made it clear. I, I wasn't looking at my note, but my point here is that it was the violence that made the difference. We had an important lesson to learn from the fact that only physical violence created the panic when finally German Jews in great numbers desperately tried to leave the country. I am suggesting that the gradual acceptance of earlier restrictions on their daily lives and the normalization, what does normalization mean? It simply means that what should not be normal slowly is accepted. Oh, he's a liar. So, should it be okay to have a liar <laughs> as a politician? Please, that's how it starts, or that's how it ends, or both. So this kind of acceptance and normalization of laws and regulations that ought to have been questioned and resisted encouraged the National Socialist government to increase anti-Jewish legislation and eventual guaranteed uh, 
excuse me. Oh, I see. In this country, many still wonder whether or not the increase in anti-Semitic incidents. The ADL tells us there have been 120 anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses. I'm sure I have that number wrong. It's a great deal more, many more than that. This is an old number. And the vandalism of the New England Holocaust Memorial some of them are wondering whether this really indicates an increase in anti-Semitism. Timothy Snyder, a Yale historian and a recognized authority on the Holocaust, has this warning. I'm quoting Snyder. The symbols of today, swastikas painted on the walls of schools' bathrooms, are the reality of tomorrow. Do not look away and do not get used to them. The danger is in the gradual acceptance and normalization of behavior that ought not be accepted because these are the early signs of how a democracy can be gradually undermined and destroyed. More recently, I've been asked how and in what way does the current situation in the United States resemble the situation in Germany in the 30s? What are the similarities and what are the differences? Clearly, the differences are far greater than are the similarities. The two countries differ in all important aspects. They differ in their histories and in their political and social circumstances. In my opinion, what happened in Europe during World War II and the 12 years of tyranny in Nazi Germany could never happen in this country. But this does not mean that we have nothing to worry about. There are good reasons why many people are making the comparison. Germany's slide, and this is very important to me, Germany's slide into a popular embrace of authoritarianism that ended in tyranny offers a frame of understanding how liberal democracies can, in a relatively short period of time, be totally destroyed. In the past, <laughs> Whenever I, the children ask me, and they always do, when I give my little talk to the children, Dr. Ornstein, can it happen in this country? I was always, oh, no way. We are a multi-ethnic, multicultural community. We have, it's no longer so quick. I'm not, no longer so quick in my response. Because democracy is a very, difficult way of governing. It's a very fragile system. It needs constant attention and constant care. We have to worry, because in this country too, the search is on for scapegoats. This time the scapegoats are not Jews, but immigrants. Once a minority is scapegoated, the Jews are not far behind. Anti-Semitism is there to tap it and, and to scratch the surface and you find it. The scapegoating of immigrants appears to have a racist undercurrent and not based on evidence that immigrants in any way present a danger to America. To the contrary, the review of the histories of the most recent immigrants indicates that all immigrants had stood out as highly accomplished contributors 
to the economic and cultural life of this country. As of today, out of the close 1,000 MacArthur Fellows, these are the young geniuses, some of you know the MacArthur, close to 22% are foreign born. Out of the 300 American Nobel Prize winners, more than 100 were immigrants. Immigrants coming from countries where they were oppressed and could not attend universities have been the most highly motivated groups in their chosen fields, in the sciences, in medicine, literature, and in entrepreneurship. In spite of anti-Semitism, an institution of higher, I have my papers a little mixed up, higher um, learning, I must say, someplace, uh, it only took one or mostly two generations of Jewish immigrants for their children to move from the Lower East Side into their doctor and law offices in mid-Manhattan. Jews had it very good in this country. As fewer and fewer people have been emigrating from Europe, illegal immigration from Mexico had increased, an issue that is hotly debated across the country. I'm definitely not in the position to address this matter. I only have strong reaction to what the human consequences are to this dilemma. Specifically, how families are torn apart by the increasing number of deportations. Recently, I heard a case of a mother and a son who left the country the same day. The day the mother was deported, the son was, the son was deployed to the war zone in Iraq. One deployed, the other deported. It reminded me of two young Jewish men who having recently arrived in this country, enlisted into the army, hoping that this would make it possible for them to rescue their parents from Poland, where mass killings of Jews became a daily event. While the young men fought the good war, their parents perished in a German concentration camp. We have reason to worry regarding our current political situation because racism is still a potent presence in social and political life in America. The United States passed racial laws that the Nazis used to boost their own. In the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, America led the world in race-based legislations. These laws guaranteed immigration from Northern Europe and limited entrance of Jews, Italians, Asians, and others. Violators of the mixed marriage laws were severely punished. However, by putting American racial laws into the context of the larger, more dominant American history, makes it clear that this was not the direction that the country had taken in the 20th century. After defeating Nazi Germany, the government embraced a more liberal and progressive tone, and the advocates for white supremacy went into the shadows. The 20th century witnessed a strong civil rights movement. Gays and lesbians had achieved legitimacy as the country was returning to the principles on which it was founded. It was returning to the principles of human equality. Recognizing the dangers that any state might become dominant with a particular ideology, the Constitution, our founding document, set limits to the power of the states. Up until recently, until January 2017, the federal government has been opposing and was actively fighting against endemic racism, against discrimination based on ethnicity and religion. I believe that there are two areas in our democratic system of government 
that now need special protection. One is the area of ju jurisdiction. The courts have to resist any attempt to be swayed by partisan politics, and so far they are holding their own. The other area to watch for is to secure a free and independent press on the daily assault at the moment. We are all fearfully watching the next incident when attempts are made to circumvent the law of the land. These are all the travel bans that so far have been resisted. And we dread the next Twitter message that will assault and undermine the legitimacy of the free press. Not minimizing the importance of the courts, I believe that undermining the confidence of the press is particularly dangerous. The danger is related to the subtle and imperceptible means by which the confidence in a free press is being undermined. When news organization and social media no longer report only what they had carefully checked for accuracy, when so-called fake news begin to dominate the airwaves and the internet, or when news that is not to the liking of the president is labeled fake news, confusion is being created and we are being exposed to what I call propaganda. I don't have to call it, you all call it that. What happened in Germany is a good example of this. The idea that Jews were responsible for Germany losing the First World War and that Jews, were uh, that Jews created the global economic depression and were responsible for worldwide unemployment. You remember the 1929, you don't remember, but you, <laughs> you know about the, the worldwide unemployment. When these news were repeated on radio and disseminated by pamphlets, they had the power to convince the average German citizen that it was their patriotic duty to help the Führer to rid the country from these destructive elements, the Jews. This then, you understand the killing machines that were set up. These were the people who now, nine, over 90%, Hitler was democratically elected. He was not a dictator. At the beginning, he was. He was democratically elected. And it was based already on the 1930s being filled with this news about the Jews. And there, naturally, it was every patriotic German man and woman's duty to kill these people who had done that to their country. On occasion, when I speak on this subject, I ask my audience whether they knew how many Jews lived in Germany at the time Hitler came to power. May I engage you in that little exercise? Would anybody dare to volunteer how many Jews percentage-wise lived in Germany at the time that Hitler came to power? And during the 30s? Any number will do. 5%, 5% sounds very good to me. Any other bidding? 20. Open bidding? <laughs> what would you say? Uh, maybe 20%. 20%, 5%, anybody else? What would you say if I tell you that it was 0.8%, not quite. 07 not quite 1%. But you have to recognize, very prominent. Jews were in the literature, they were in the sciences, and it was not all that difficult to think that they were 20%, as somebody said, or 5%. They were less than 1%. They were prominent, active in the sciences, music, theater, literature. <coughs> was easy to overestimate. What can those of us who care about human rights and free speech do 
before it's too late. And in this country, I am not talking about concentration camps or, or any of that. But we are holding ourselves to a totally different standard. We have the world's only functional democracy. I say only because in reality, I do believe that. This is, if you live ever and you know what happened and is happening in countries like Poland and Hungary, you live in paradise. You have free speech. You are not arrested for saying ugly stuff about ugly people. <laughs> you may be thinking, you know, but this, this is a, what shall I tell you? Those who had lived, and I see <laughs> Mira <laughs> sitting front of me, born in Hungary and raised in Israel and living in this country, you had some experiences, especially with the Russians, what it is to live under autocracy. So what can we do? The greatest danger is to do nothing. Dismissing Hitler as a madman who could not possibly achieve his aim to systematically kill the physically and mentally handicapped was the first big mistake, the euthanasia. You all know about the program. German euthanasia was Nazi Germany's rehearsal to the subsequent genocide. But at first, nobody objected to these activities, either inside or outside Germany. America was very slow to wake up. And we did not actually remove our um, um, ambassador from the, uh, Germany until Germany. Did you know that? It was Germany who declared war on America. Only after Germany declared war on America in 1941 that the Americans said, yes, we want to go to war with you too. <laughs> But this was not a popular idea. There was one country, and here I am going to stop. I am ready, you heard about my country, Hungary, and they were allied with the Germans, and how we ended up being caught in that situation. Hungary had a very tiny, small, relatively small Jewish population. It's a small country to begin with less than a million people, but more than half of them were killed in a very, very short period of time. Uh, and my whole family was among them. Two brothers, my 96-year-old grandmother, <laughs> always dreamed about being buried next to my grandfather, but no, she too died in the gas chamber. So I'm going to stop now. I promised Linda I will not speak more than 20 minutes. Did I hold on to that? You're good. Am I good? You are so good. Yeah, so people, I really gave you a lot to think about and a lot to discuss. And I am here to participate, but without your responses and your questions, your opinions, no questions are not, whatever, <laughs> questions, statements, opinions, worries, good, positive, optimistic thinking, I take all of it, please. Mm. And, and there is one. Right here. Heard, right here. Um, Go ahead. I'm going to get you the mic. Just oh, give us a question for one second. Okay. That, could you give the. It's all over once you give the mic. We're just in good accessibility here. So we wanna, yeah, we want to make sure that we, if you cannot hear, please let us know. And can you stand up, Dimitra? Sure. Sorry, now can you hear this? No. 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 Can you hear this? Yes. Hi, my name is Dimitra. Um, Your first name? Dimitra. Dimitra. I'm Greek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Half Irish. Um, so you had pointed out two things 
which I'm now going to forget. You're going to remind me. Free press and the court. Thank you. I wonder, in your experience going into schools over all these years, are you also concerned about the quality of education <laughs> the kids are getting in terms of learning? I mean, basic history, also our history here of racism, how that fed into what Hitler was doing, which then fed into apartheid, which then, and now here we are again. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you know, um, beautiful question, by the way, okay. such as <laughs> going right there. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, here, I can't take that. My okay, you'll get, you'll get feedback. feedback if I give you Oh, I see. Okay, so you hear me okay? Yeah. And you had heard me the whole time I mm -hmm. spoke up. I love your question, uh, Dimitra. This is really a very important one. Maybe I had made a mistake here, but now you alerted me to watch more carefully and to look around more carefully. Uh, it was always very important to me that the children be prepared a little bit about what happened in Germany and a little bit about the Holocaust. They didn't have to know an awful lot, but it was good. And this school is outstanding. I mean, I just love coming into this situation because I could always count on that. And the questions the children were eager to ask. And I would say this school stands out a little bit as not being the average <laughs> in that sense. You know, it's really, but it also skewed my perspective. It didn't give me an overall uh, impression the way that I now wish I had, that I would say, oh my God, I've been going to so many schools. I, what would I say about the average? Uh, the preparation is good in this area, but I cannot say anything about how it is in general. However, it, something very interesting came to my attention more recently about that. And I am not uh, seeing it as a problem, actually. You, you pointed to it. Are we teaching, are we, I'm not a teacher, uh, is being, uh, that is always a little bit of not remember, you know, what we remember and what we forget. We, we tend to forget our problem areas. There is a tendency, and that would be a, a really big problem, and I am so glad you pointed to this, to see ourselves as a perfection. You know, we are the good people, and they are the, they are the problem one. And always try to bring it a little bit closer to we all have to take responsibility for what is happening. I paid particular attention to the importance of the Constitution, the fragility of the democracy, to, because I felt that that would be difficult for an American youngster. Oh, you know, it's such a complicated piece of paper, but it really is unique in its brilliance. <laughs> especially how it protects the weak and, and, the, and the, speak, the ones who cannot speak for themselves, so to speak. You know, we have in our say that uh, the four children who are asking questions, and one of them is who cannot even ask. And I think that maybe we have failed our children to be more aware of the problem areas. Thank you for bringing it to the open a little more, making me more conscious of listening for that. Um, if you have a question that you don't want to speak aloud into the microphone, you can pass it down the aisles. And um, Linda and Janice are walking around with baskets. And Hank has a basket, too, um, to collect questions. Um, do you have one yet for me to read? No? Okay. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Linda. So we are having a little trouble hearing, um, Dr. Ornstein. We have an expert here, Ben Pike from RCTV. He's our expert 
a lot oh here I hear my voice <laughs> um, now I am sure nobody has trouble hearing yeah, yeah. it should be possible um, uh, we spent a lot of time discussing it and uh, this is a little bit of a formula but let me share it with you and then you see whether it would work for you People who feel very strongly that everything is just fine and is actually is going their way, so no, you cannot argue about, uh, you know, they feel very comfortable. But there are many people who are kind of wondering back and forth, and they say, yes, but, and raising. It's easy to, it, it, not easy, but it's easier to engage that way. What I would recommend under all circumstances, you have to listen to the other. They have their good reason to think the way they do, like we do. <laughs> you know, if you think, we are in a bubble too. We all live in a bubble. And I would say that to the Jewish card. We have good reason to have an extra ear. <laughs> So if, if we are told, look, you are being sensitive because you are Jewish, you know, you, um, uh, what is it called when they put into the mind, uh, no, you, what is it called? No, 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 I am thinking about how you alert people when there is a fire or, you know, there will be people who will spot the problem a little bit ahead of time. What's wrong with that? That should be, yeah, what is it called? Canary in the corner. The canna, yeah, correct, yeah. Somebody will be there who may be picking up stuff, but it's spread. These things are not, if, if you, because there has always been anti-Semitism, and nobody is going to question it anymore. It is just the way it has been, and we Jews have been living with that. <laughs> That's how it is. It has, uh, in general, the opportunities in this country for Jews have been just as good as for anybody else. There had been no uh, holding back when it came to uh, at, you know, admission to the universities or any of the, this problem. So, uh, so let us be more, because that is our history. And uh, it doesn't mean that it isn't so. <laughs> Just because we hear it earlier, or we make a little bit more of it, so to speak, uh, it's terribly important to be uh, listening to other people. I like to would say this when I encountered this particular situation, considering that I have no 
I cannot put my mind there that I am so I am having such difficulty seeing the light in that. I wish you would convince me. Tell me what got you to feel so good about this. Maybe it will help me not to be so strong in my perspective. If you invite that kind of a interest in the other per it is not easy because it happened to me the other night that I wasn't prepared. And the first reaction I felt was rage. I felt such anger, I said, mm -hmm, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> this is the time to, to console, console yourself, is that it? To tell yourself to be quiet and then get yourself into the place where you feel a little bit more calmer and said, considering that I feel so scared and worried, I would love to hear what is it that makes you feel so confident? Thank you. Not easy. Not easy to do that, but believe me, it will help. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Here. Over there. <laughs> So this is um, sort of a follow-up question and one that we heard a little bit at the kickoff event, but um, we might um, hear a little bit more from you tonight. Sure. Um, so uh, this question is from an audience member. The swastikas continue to appear in our town. What is the best way to respond? Now, um, yeah, you can... took me to school yes. at, <laughs> at our kickoff event. I was sitting down at the other end of the table, and I wish we had 20 more minutes to um, to talk with each other on the panel because there I was in my collar that night and you you know somebody in the audience said um, said you know basically what's the best way to you know, we have we have Nazis marching in the streets again now right it was because we we were meeting just right after Charlottesville and, and the, um, the 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 event and the counter protest had just happened in Boston maybe the the week before or two weeks before. And um, somebody said, we have Nazis marching on the street again now, so what, what do we do now? What, how, how do we respond now? And your response was, was similar to what you just said, which was listen to them, listen to what their, what their reasons are for believing what they believe. And I was sort of incredulous and you know, sitting there as I'm supposed to be a woman of God, right? I'm sitting there in my collar at the other end of the table sort of going, really? Like that's what, that's what you want us to do? Like listening, that's the answer. So you like absolutely took me to school um, the last time. And so, that, so that's the question to you. The swastikas are still happening. And I think especially um, when we can't, you know, when we're not seeing people actively write them but it's clear that the sentiment is there. How do we respond? No, you can respond only when you have a person to respond. To the item, you cannot. I mean, you can clean it up. <laughs> but um, uh, I know this is, this is really a big problem that the schools or wherever the event occurs have to locate. The, and you all engage in that. I suspect that 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 is, and my answer is, is really, especially if it is a young person. I think that, I, I see the, the young person, I have much less problem than with adults. Because these children, many of them, are exposed to a variety of opinions, and they don't know what to make of it. And they are more confused, not that they don't know what the swastika means, and it's important, let me uh, just, this is a little side trip, not to the issue that you asked me. But let me say that the person who puts down the swastika may not know exactly, but the person who looks at it reads it that way. And this is why we all react. And then the community reacts, it reacts because it read the stuff. <laughs> It read the stuff because grown up knows what it means. And then if you think of it that way, if it was a child or a teenager, then it, it makes you 
it's easier because it immediately puts you more into the place of an educator. Now you have a chance to say something. Once you, the person is, and not to shame the child. That would be naturally the thing that we do <laughs> in a natural way. But I don't see this is much different than what you ha how you handle anger generally in your family, because you get annoyed with people in your family. Oh, he didn't flush the toilet again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you just, <laughs> I'm just thinking of that, you know, or, or, or something. How many times do I have to tell him or her to do this or that? And then you calm yourself and you say, maybe I have to remind that kid one more time, or I have to, uh, your mom, I had to run away, or, you know, the bell was ringing or somebody. It's always the car that's waiting for me for the, you know, isn't it? <laughs> Why? <laughs> it is that the, uh, what do you call it already? You can tell how far back in my child, in my life, that is the person who picks up the child for you. The, the carpool. The carpool, the carpool, <laughs> the carpool. The carpool was it. Okay, it is a question of finding the person. And to really, the kids themselves will be surprised if you handle it with empathy and with some eagerness to find out. Uh, if you start out with the question, did you know what it means, which is, would be the first question I would like to know, you know, uh, is don't ask any question. You can just say that I have to, it's difficult for me to decide if you knew what happens when I look at it and what comes to my mind. I think that this is what you meant by the crumpling of the, okay? That we do things that we don't think of the impact that it has. And that happens all the time in small ways and in big ways. So we have to think that uh, not that the child did or did not know, I don't know what it means, but they could not have thought the way Timothy Snyder thinks of it, that the symbol today is reality tomorrow. You have a question? No? So I was just think, thinking that um, another aspect of this is we do have some teachers in our group, and they are sorry, and they are ooh, they are um, currently dealing with this. And I was wondering if anyone wants to share some of examples of how you are helping the kids understand the import and the impact of these swastikas without putting anybody on the spot. But is there anybody that we did it today? So, sorry, I'm not trying to monopolize. No. Although I have been accused of that before. Um, so, I teach at Parker, and we just did this today. We have an advisory now at Parker, um, once or twice a week, depending on the schedule. And today's advisory was in response to finding the two swastikas in the boys' room a few weeks ago. And um, the, I don't know if Mrs. Shanklin is still here. Um, our wonderful principal and some of the social studies teachers put together a PowerPoint explaining really what is a swastika, what is a concentration camp, what, what's the What is it about. called? What did you call it? They put together what? A PowerPoint. A PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and each teacher has a small group, about 13 or 14 kids. Um, and, and that happened today. So we actually, I haven't heard any feedback because it was just today, but in my group, because I'm one of only two Jewish teachers at Parker, I gave my kids a lot more information because I have a lot more information. And so I think they had a slightly different experience than many of the other children. Um, but I don't know what the outcome is, but I feel like it was a fantastic first step. Wonderful, what wonderful. Was response? What, what well, my kids in my room were just you know, horrified 
they had they learned a lot. They were not aware of all the horrors. Um, they really didn't understand any, any, everything that was going on. But they did know that swastika represented anti-Semitism. Um, but you know, they we we're going to meet again Friday and talk about it. And they really didn't have a lot of chance to process it. But they, when they left, they were pretty horrified. Well, I cannot think of a better way than through the education that you said. I think it is a beautiful, positive answer to a challenge. And I often say, don't worry when these things come out. You know, when you say, I hope it won't happen again, you hope that if it is there, it should happen again. In other words, there is a, a silver lining in this, uh, some of these things that we see that uh, it's good because we can deal with these things more directly. Hi, um, I'm Laura Warren. I'm a teacher here at Coolidge, and uh, we do extensive education here. Um, uh, we have, after, we've also done a presentation on the symbols of hate. Um, the kids, I feel, were very open, responsive, and asked a lot of questions, very engaged. Um, I think they learned a lot. Our eighth grade also does a Holocaust unit. They read books about the Holocaust. We've had Anna come, and she's coming back. Um, she's always a wonderful speaker here. And, um, and we also are starting an advisory with um, Facing History in Ourselves, which is talking about community and identity, um, and is introducing kids to the topic of the other, and, uh, learning to live with differences too. So lots of different angles. What age group? Six through eight. Yeah. This is really an exceptional situation that you have that, and you have the advantage of having facing history, and they are, they are so eager to come into the school and give you the guidance that you need to do that. What you did it was really wonderful. So I have one more card. I have one more card to read. Yeah. It's got two. It's got two questions. Would you like them one at a time? What them? Sure. Right. So I'll read them both, and then. Yeah. Um, what suggestions do you have to develop more of a sense of us instead of us and them in Reading? And number two is, how do we address the assumptions we have about others? How do we address? The assumptions that we have about others. Oh my god, this is very smart. <laughs> yeah. That is really, really very good. I tell you, um, it is interesting. I Let me speak to the first one. It is amazing how important little things end up becoming big thing. You know, if everybody does a little bit, even, you know, encounters in a grocery store or on the street, you can tell that that happened to those of us where we didn't have uh, our children that uh, they were raised to be anti-Semitic. In other words, no, but in their schools, there was no facing history or any of that. that. That was not possible. What it is like for a Jewish child, that I, I can speak about myself, when the, young, the children I was playing with don't want to play with you anymore, and you don't know why. I, am, I have the same eyes and ears and nose and everything, but you turned into somebody else. And that, that comes really from the homes. That is difficult to do only in the school because attitudes about others really come down generations. Uh, my husband and I wrote a paper about prejudice and how prejudice can go into murderousness. In other words, we are all familiar with prejudice. And then as psychoanalyst and then living uh, the, under those circumstances that we did, we have to recognize that a certain, when you say a certain amount, 
what I said earlier, that we are first responding to our own kind. So the same way with prejudice, it, it promotes cohesion within the group. And we have to welcome that. It is, for me, when people said, OK, you don't have to have a ghetto in America. The Jews will live in ghettos anyway. And the blacks, that's fine, because it is their choice. And it, the choice makes sense that you want to be living with people who hold the same ideals, have the same customs. and. Uh, but then comes this other thing, that as a democracy, you learn. And that is what makes it so noble, that it is not natural, <laughs> that you had to acquire that, that it says something about your growth, and your, that we now say people who are stuck in their prejudicial attitude, we call them narrow-minded. Because narrow-minded is, this comes natural, so you do it. You live them, but you open up, and you are broad-minded or more metropolitan, you know. That is when you can live in your ghetto, but you can live anywhere else that you might. <coughs> and so when you ask about the others, it is really, the, for me, uh, not an American born, I had a hard time understanding racism. I didn't understand why hating people that the whites actually uh, repressed and mistreated <laughs> and exploited. This last weekend, before Thanksgiving weekend, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we lived for 45 years. And Cincinnati, Ohio, if anybody from your group ever goes to that city, ought to go and see the Underground Railroad Museum. It is magnificent. It is the aesthetically, historically, the most pleasing thing you want to see in your life. And I, you, don't, you will not learn what I had to learn, because you are Americans. You learned American history. But I must tell you, I did not know the depth of racism, the horrible desire to kill, because there is a, a brief but an amazing film that Ofra Winfrey is uh, narrating. And it shows the house where a, a, a minister lived with his two sons. I don't know where he came from, but he was very either from Norway or Danish. It was the whitest looking white man <laughs> I had seen with two blonde boys. And these people had received the, ref the blacks coming across from Kentucky in the middle of the night. He did not send others or soldiers to meet the, the people who were coming, but his own sons. And then you see the people on horsebacks who are hunting. The, in the middle of the night, the ones who are coming across. And the, uh, as they run across the river, Ohio wasn't as wide as it is now. And you have to see that and to realize what danger did these blacks have that they had to be uh, prevented from coming across and or they had to be killed. And I came away feeling that racism is almost like in the DNA, or it is so deep that it will be probably extremely difficult to overcome in this country. But it is because it is so difficult to overcome that every little 
uh, inroad that can be made in that direction will be an accomplishment. And I think the blacks look upon that themselves. And in that respect, I feel very privileged as a Jew because I came aware that as long as your skin is white, you can get along, you can get away. But any little bit that your color or your physiognomy is different, you are in danger. And that had come a long way in this country. And what is it, after all, these are the people who made America rich, at least the South, with their slave labor. And what is the fear? Because the fear is probably from retaliation, but there is no sign of it. So it is now just simply the blackness, the color. And that is a study in itself that I have not undertaken, but I learned since I've been living in this country and having seen that uh, place, and I recommend if you ever get to see, um, uh, that is amazing. But I don't know if I answered the question. We have another question. About the other. The other, it's very, very difficult, and you have to work on it. So I'm hearing very loud and clear that even though people might gravitate to who they feel comfortable with, it takes great effort to recognize what we don't know about other people and make the effort to get closer <laughs> and to understand and listen, really listen, and talk to other people even if we're not comfortable. Can I say one more thing, and it has to do with the Constitution? Because it is amazing to me that our forefathers knew where the dangers lurked. And they built in certain protection. So what is not in nature could be in nurture. <laughs> it's in the papers. It is on our, if we would indeed live by the principles, we are then real patriots because we live the way that we are supposed to live. And I felt that after the defeat of Germany, that was the direction that this country was going. Tough as it was, they, you did not have federally approved racial uh, laws. They were against it. They were on the lookout because they knew that is still a danger. But now, when that falls aside, when it is no longer recognized as a danger because it is, then we have to worry about real racism. We have a question over here. Thanks, Linda. I'll try to be brief. Um, <coughs> We've heard a lot about what the schools are doing, and, and I, I hear it, I get their emails. And um, going back to the question of swastikas uh, being found in our schools, um, the schools have it, have it easy because they have a captive audience that, that they can address uh, about these swastikas. Um, I'm a somewhat newly elect, elected selectman in town, and what if, advice would you give to the selectmen for reaching out to a town that is spread out and is not a captive audience? Now, you know, the principle is the same, isn't it? I feel that Americans are wonderful people. I had nothing but good experiences and love and, I mean, by nature, I think good life had good, uh, nurtured good qualities. I really do believe that hardship brings the worst out of us. <laughs> that good life gives you the opportunity to be more generous. And you are a very generous by basically, and you cannot generalize on that. And I would count on that somehow, that again I would distinguished that this is something that you get by education and through your own example. 
And your own example would be that you listen to them the way that you do as if they were children. Don't you think, kind of, but not, I don't mean to be condescending, but <laughs> with respect that they must have, and I believe they do because it comes down from generations. It is within families that becomes a religion. This is the sad part of it, that it becomes part of your way of being, uh, I don't know what, really white or whatever, <laughs> that you properly hate. You know, my husband liked to make a joke of it, but it wasn't. He was said about a Hungarian, so I, uh, most of them are anti-Semitic just because it is, you know, part of the culture to be that way. He says in, uh, there was a gentleman in the parliament, similar to a selectman situation, who defined who is an anti-Semite. An anti-Semite is somebody who hates a Jew more than absolutely necessary. <laughs> This is a sad state of affairs, but what is sad that there is something that goes with the total cultural way of being that includes a certain amount of prejudice about blacks or Jews or Muslims or whoever. Who is not us. Who is not us, that's part of it. And to overcome it in families where this is part of the way of being, it's not easy. But you see the exceptions, and you are celebrating it. You celebrate the person who says, and I knew a young woman who was in the Peace Corps, who grew up a very, very prejudicial family, who could not stand the idea that she went to the Peace Corps and would become so, you know, giving two years of her life to these black people? What on earth are you doing? But she did it. And it was her way of saying, I cannot live with these ideas. That takes a certain kind of courage. And I would suggest that when you see that, don't take it for granted. It does not come natural to love the people who are not like you. Can I follow up to that a little bit? So I grew up in the South, and um, I haven't admittedly been in New England very long, but I have seen a similar um, dynamic in New England as in the South, which is a little bit of um, conflict avoidance, especially with white folks like myself. So I um, have very little problem sitting and listening to somebody who disagrees with me or whose position um, I disagree with. But when we get to the point of uh, beyond that, right, so after we have listened to each other, then I get to a then what, right? So when we're, when we're trying to move to the next step, that's when I have a problem. That's when I, I have trouble getting to the next step, especially if the person um, I'm sitting across from has trouble recognizing my full human. Don't you see so that's the problem? So that they can don't you help me get to use, even though you uh, right. So how, do, so how do we get to that next step if the person who's who's across the table refuses no, to engage in that, in yeah, that same no, respect? And then, then you, said, you make it very clear. You articulate what you just told me. I'm not sure you really want to take the next step because you have not heard what I had to say. And I heard what you had to say. And some people got up and they said, no, I don't want to hear it. And I tell you what happens to in some of these instances, because I've been into some of them. People live with illusions. And this is another part of our human way of being. We cannot quite give up certain illusions that make life a bit more tolerable for many people who have a hard life, <laughs> okay? And then you may have come to a point that they have to hold on 
to certain illusions and fantasies that you, from your position, could recognize as such, that they cannot afford to. Like what? So, uh, I don't want to bring in sure. <laughs> the political situation, sure. but you take, for example, lies I mentioned earlier. Like they, craft a, uh, like they craft a picture for themselves that they don't want to. It's fine with them. Yeah. Because it gives the illusion that life could actually be better. But there is no evidence. In other words, in my discussion, and this happened just fairly recently, when the person came to the point of saying, no, I don't care how much he lies but I still believe. And then I say, this is now a territory that it's hard. Right. Because reality has no place anymore. Right. The way that I would think. Because the person, him, herself, it was a woman, accepted the idea that she needed that line. If my, if I don't, if, if, if you know, there is this story for the, uh, I remember that from my childhood about the uh, stone soup. Yeah. You remember the yeah. story about the stone soup? Yeah. Now we said a lot of stone soup stories in camp. And then you pretended that the water was a soup or the water. And you, and, and you see modification of something similar too. When there is a belief in something that as far as you can tell, there is nothing, no evidence for it. So what do you build it on, they ask me, that he will not do such and such? Only on the past, <laughs> certainly, just what I had heard. So yes, that's a problem. And so, so if we extrapolate that then, not just person-to-person -person relationships, but if we look at that sort of societally, I mean, what you're talking about, um, making sure that there's a, a free and responsible press, right, is, is crucial yes. um, because those interactions are, are happening writ large in our, in our society, in those echo chambers, right? Cool. Um, and so if we're in situations where, um, where where reality or facts don't matter for a, a broad swath of the society, then we're in a situation in which propaganda has a toehold. Exactly, yes. exactly. And this is why I admire Linda. Because I, I really think, and, and you people, because your stand also takes courage. You could have just as well leave the matter alone. You didn't. You know, the first set of swastikas. And here you are, doing this. I'm not alone. <laughs> I know, but these kinds of conversations are, at the moment, the best thing we can do. Yeah. And we're doing them. And that is why I came, sick or not sick. <laughs> <laughs> I no, these are crucial issues. Yes. Sorry? No, the issues are crucial. Um, yeah. This question, I, have, I will come back to the other question back there. If you have other questions, I want to just say it is quarter of nine, and we have a rule with Reading Embraces Diversity that we really want people to come back, and one way to make sure that happens is not to go over that nine o'clock. <laughs> no. So, um, we are respecting that. So I'm gonna read this question, which came a while ago from the audience, and we have another question back there. Is there anyone else that's waiting with a question? Because we'll, we'll sort of tailor our, the length of our answers to make sure that we can. You better watch my. <laughs> okay, yeah. I am the talk. So just let me know if there's another question out there. Sooner than later, so that, oh, and there's a third question, okay. So um, this question is, some households in Reading have put hate has no home here signs. 
um, in, at, in front of their homes. These signs have been somewhat polarizing on social media. How should we as a community show our commitment to diversity inclu and inclusion if a sign ends up offending when your intent was the opposite? <laughs> That will be, a, this is always the question of negotiation, yeah? yeah. <laughs> what I intended and what is being experienced, it's difficult to figure how you can see that as a dividing line. Let's not hit, um, because it's so clear, <laughs> no? I don't know. This. I do have one um, thought from where Yeah, I, I would can. prefer if you share it, because for me this is so obvious. So I have had some conversations, and one of the ways I was grappling with this, and we do have this sign in front of our house, was to look for the origins of this sign, which if you look online, you follow the, um, the link on the signs, it brings you to actually a school whose children and families were in danger of being deported. And so this school wanted to make the statement that their, their families were safe in their community, in their school. So it wasn't politically motivated. It was motivated because the children and the families wanted to let to their friends and their neighbors know that they would be safe with us. They are safe here. And so that wasn't born of a political motive. It was born of the desire to let people know that they're welcome and they're protected and safe. So that's, yeah, that's exactly. one way I approach again, it's education. I've always wondered how is there a missing piece of that because of the word hate? And it implies there's hate. But you can't find anything offensive. So what I just heard is that for some people it feels offensive because it implies there is hate in a community, and this goes back to what you were talking about, it implies there's hate in a community that doesn't feel that, doesn't perceive the same thing as others do, which to tie in what you've been saying, Dr. Weinstein, is the conversation <coughs> needs to go there. Mm -hmm. So if I perceive there to be hate and you don't perceive there to be hate, so how do we see each other's perspectives to a place where we can become Yes. Comfortable accepting that nuance. Right. Or and that comes from the dialogue. Mm -hmm. That comes from the conversation. Right. Yes. That's not a question that I'm willing to ask of someone that I'm that I've just met, likely. That's a question that I'm only willing to ask if I've met you or known you several times and we've earned some trust with each other. Right? And and a lot of us just really don't know each other that well, right? So it takes some relationship. Our, Which is what so, we want to do here. So just briefly, our church put up a hate has no home here sign, and um, we ended up making our own instead of adopting the one that um, the red and blue ones that are around town. And the reason that we came to that decision was a because the ones that were red, white, and blue um, like felt like they looked a little political to my church council, who d decides things democratically, and um, and b because we wanted to involve the the community in that message. Um, and in order to um, nuance that message a little bit and explain what we meant by it, the church made a second sign. So we have two big signs um, on our church. One says, hate has no home here, and the other says, God is love. And it sort of like exegetes our, our message. So explains the second message. explains the first. That's right. How are you That's right. Yeah, here is another question. Are you following that? Gonna, no. I was, but I don't know. It's a follow-up. Next. And I promise I'll be fast. Um, sorry. Yeah, but, but it is a political sign because it, the school started it in response to a particular time when their families were in danger because of... A certain politician. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm good with politics. This town has, you know, feisty arguments and we get into it. That's what it's about. So it is political. And if you're not into it, you're not into it, but it is political. And if anyone would like to ask me why I have that sign, I'm happy to have that conversation. But I'm not taking down the sign. But I'm happy to have the conversation. 
And I think it can be, it, it can be two things, right? Two things can be true. I just love Linda's promotion of dialogue. And I think that there is a lot to it. It takes time. You have to devote time to understand each other and yourself too in the process. Hi, I didn't want to interrupt um, Sherry Vandenacker. And I wanted to follow up, if I could, with you, Reverend, that um, I come from a family with a lot of substance abuse in it. And I worked in um, a college dormitory. And one thing that I learned and that I still struggle to do all the time is to continue to come back with love in the sense that one of the most valuable things I learned was that having a difficult conversation with a student or a friend or a neighbor or a family member or myself um, is that somebody said, you know, maybe this student who's having a problem with um, bulimia, maybe when you speak to her and she says, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, maybe she needs to hear that 30 times or 112 times, or 115 times, and maybe your person 29 of the 30, or maybe your person 111 of the 112. So don't give up, and the fact that the discussion maybe might not yield what we want it to, it's still part of the process of the dialogue, and part of the process of the discovery. Beautiful, beautiful. And that gives me hope. Thank you. Very nice, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Very nice, really. Such mature statements, beautiful. I am always <laughs> going home with a lot more insight than I can. Are there any other questions? Did you have another question? I wanted to apologize to you because I felt like I. Like That's the greeting you. Dimitra, this is the greeting. <laughs> No, I tell you what. We, we could, we could spend. Uh, if you, would, uh, I would be all for it. <laughs> Truth and reconciliation was quite an experience, and there are some good books. If we all read that little book by Puma, 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 what is her name? Oh. Mm. Pema. 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 Yeah. The woman who went into the into the jail to visit with this white uh, Afrikaner. Mm -hmm. no, you didn't read the book. She knows it. She, she knows. Knows. Make sure she, Dimitra gets to read that book, will you? And then I come back and we discuss it. Okay. <laughs> well, that was that was actually a great segue, Demetra. Thank you very much. Because as we said when we started, we are continuing this conversation. It is not over. And as Sherry just said, it doesn't happen after one conversation or after five conversations. We're going to work to be there for each other. And part of what that entails is, here's our ask. You each receive an evaluation form. <laughs> And on that evaluation form, we want to we want your feedback about our goals with this event, but also what you would like to see in the future. So we have a poster out there with, where we've been collecting ideas. <coughs> we're taking what's on these evaluation forms and we're adding those. So I I guess I say too often Rome wasn't built in a day, but we're here for the long run, and so. We love your ideas. We love your energy. I know everybody doesn't have the time, energy, or wherewithal to make everything happen. But little things, baby steps, make a huge difference. And maybe sometime you have time, and maybe sometime you don't. But your voice is always important. And so we want to invite you to our next meeting. If you have time, if you can't make this meeting, you're always welcome to the next meeting. Our meeting is on Wednesday, December 6th at 7 at Old South. So please consider coming. Tell people about this meeting. Tell them thank you, RCTV, because it will be available. 
both on RCTV and I believe on YouTube. So, so it makes it very convenient. If you only have 15 minutes at a time, you can go back for the next 15 minutes. And you can take notes and decide what questions you didn't get answered. And we have a Facebook page. And we welcome you to reach out to us and an email. So please, the Human Relations Advisory Committee and Reading Embraces Diversity, we need you. And hopefully, we all need each other. No, I won't say hopefully. We all need each other. <laughs> I know we do. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone that made this possible. I'm going to start at begin and end with Dr. Ornstein. Um, <laughs>